Oh, hi, I'm Dr. Key. You might remember me from videos such as Dr. Key and the apostrophe. Today, speaking and listening, come with me. So, you're about to start your IGCSE speaking and listening test. There's a few things you need to know. For your IGCSE speaking and listening, you're gonna to have to do a talk of between three and four minutes. That's three and four minutes. And we've gotta be strict with that. Three or four minutes, or between the two. I've got a handy card to help me. You're gonna need one of these with short bullet points on to get you through. Once you've done your speech, your teacher's gonna to talk to you all about what you've just been talking about. This has got to last between six and seven minutes. Again, it's gotta be strict. Your teacher will keep an eye on that. Now, the thing about the discussion afterwards is your teacher shouldn't be doing all the work. They'll ask you a question, you should give a long answer. You give a short answer, you're doomed. The longer the answer, the better. We don't want teacher ask a question, you give a short answer. Once it's finished, you get a mark out of 30. That mark out of 30 will go towards your IGCSE where you're all going to do very well. That's it. Something for you to enjoy now. You're gonna see a couple of people doing a speaking and listening test. One's got a beard, not so good. But then a real treat, my son, Dr. Key Jr. He's not a doctor, but I called him doctor. We call him Doc for short, Doc Key. Hope you enjoy it. I'm about to go in for my speaking and listening test. Now, for the past few weeks, I've been preparing for this. I've written the speech out and I've practiced delivering it at home to whoever I've got available. All I'm allowed to bring to this is one cue card. And as you can see, I'm only allowed to write on one side of that. And even then, it has to be in pretty big writing and there can't be too much information on there because this has to be handed in to my teacher. They're gonna take it just in case the exam board asks for it. So I'm feeling already unprepared and I'm ready to go and deliver. Let's go and have a look. Hi, thanks for having me. I'm here to talk about Mad Max Fury Road and why I think it might be the greatest action film of our generation. Now, I know you might be wondering, what is Mad Max Fury Road and why should I care? Well, I'm gonna tell you why. Mad Max was an enormous film last year, 2015. It came out in the summer, it made over $347 million worldwide, which is an enormous success for a film where the original three came out last time in the 1980s. In fact, 1985 was the last time anyone saw or heard of Mad Max. Since 1997, George Miller's been trying to make Fury Road. He had the script ready, he had every single shot planned out on a number of storyboards in his office. Due to events like the Iraq War, 9-11, and terrorism in the locations where they were trying to film, they've not been able to get the film made until just last year. But on the release, it was mind-blowing. You might wonder, who's involved in it? And who is this Max? Why is he so mad? Well, back in the late 70s, George Miller and Mark Kennedy made a film called Mad Max. It cost less than $15,000, but the amount of money it made back at the American box office meant that they were able to make two more sequels and launch to superstardom this guy called Mel Gibson. You might have heard of him. He's a pretty big deal. But in the intervening years, the absence of Max has meant that they've needed to cast a new character. And in steps Tom Hardy. He's basically our modern action hero, a sort of faceless nobody who ends up being a lump of meat who can go through any amount of physical torture and rigor that you put him through. And in Mad Max Fury Road, he goes through a hell of a lot of it. Who else is involved? Well, the director is George Miller. Yeah, that's right, the director of the original film and the sequels, The Road Warrior and Beyond Thunderdome. He might be one of the greatest living directors, despite the fact that his output's been pretty slim. I mean, before Mad Max, his preparation for filming it was Making Happy Feet, a film about penguins that dance. I know you're thinking, that's pretty odd. How does he go from penguins that are dancing to this film set in a post-apocalyptic desert wasteland filled with hot rods and crazy cars, crossbows mounted on people's arms, and all manner of crazy tattooed spiked fools trying to kill people just to get their hands on some gasoline, or as they call it, guzzoline. Well, George Miller learned how to use CGI in that film, and subsequently, 
he's been able to implement it into Mad Max while still keeping all practical stunts where possible. That means every car and every jalopy, every burner that you see fly through the air, flipping gracefully, arcing like ballet made of scrap metal. Well, that's all real. It's just this sky and a few other elements of dust that are put in by CGI. So, after that, do we have any questions? Hello. Today I am going to be talking about my hamster. Hamsters are pets. I have, I have got a pet hamster. His name is Am Ammy. Hamsters are good pets because they are small and furry. Uh, I can't read it. Rod, 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 Rodan, Rodan, Rodans, like a rat or a mouse, but they have not got a tail. But they have got a tail. Oh. Feeding, I, feeding my hamster. I, hamsters have food. They have sunflower seeds, and they put that in their pouch. Their pouch is their mouth. On, like in your cheeks, they put their food in their cheeks. My hamster, he goes around in his wheel. Are there any questions? Oh. My first question is, how are women portrayed in this film? I'm really glad you asked that. Um, when Mad Max Fury Road came out, it was quite a lot of a, a, it was quite a big deal about the way women were portrayed. The main female character is Imperator Furiosa, played by Charlize Theron. The strange thing about her is, despite this being a post-apocalyptic film and a fantasy film that seems to be aimed at men, she's not portrayed in an overly sexualized way. She has a shaven head. A prosthetic limb made of metal where her own limb is cut off just after the elbow. And in no way is she treated as a prize for the hero to win or some sort of sex object for him to desire. Instead, what we get is possibly the greatest female action hero of all time. Can I just stop you there? What would you say to people who actually think Ripley from the Alien series is the greatest female action hero? I think that's a, a great point to make. Ripley was a superb character through four films, if we ignore the Aliens versus Predator nonsense. But the last Alien film was Alien 4, and that, that came out in about 1999. We've been starved of female action heroes for a long, long time. There's been a couple recently, so in The Hunger Games, for example. But Imperator Furiosa is actually making a feminist point. When she rescues those women, she's standing up for the rights of women. Ripley was one of the greatest sort of mother characters in action cinema and she sparred with the alien mother in, in Aliens and that was a great point to make but it wasn't really a truly feminist point. I like the way that Charlize Theron's Furiosa isn't sexualized in any way. She's not an object that Tom Hardy wins at the end of the film. In fact, they don't say an awful lot to each other throughout the course of the film. They just work together. They have a working relationship and that's it. In that sense, the film really is about her and her mission to prove that we can be equal. Gender needn't necessarily bind some people in servitude to some other people. So in that sense, I really think that Imperator Furiosa just pips Ripley at the post, which isn't to say that I don't like Ripley. I think the Aliens films are amazing. If we think of others, like Catwoman, say, from the Batman films, they seem to be overtly sexualized, dressed just so men can look at them. That's not the case with Imperator Furiosa. And as a subtext, uh, one of the, uh, several of the characters that she rescues, they're being rescued from basically bonded slavery under a man called Immortan Joe, who's the, f the film's main enemy. When she rescues them, they leave a message for the Immortan. It says, we are not property. The central message of this film is that women aren't to be controlled and had. They aren't prizes or medals or things for men to possess. They're people, just like us. Mad Max is probably the most feminist action film that's ever been made by Hollywood. And for that reason, I adore it. So, who's better? Mel Gibson as Mad Max or Tom Hardy? Well, your die-hard Mad Max fans will probably say Mel Gibson. The thing is, you couldn't cast Mel Gibson in the current film anymore. Since 1985, Mel Gibson became a megastar. The Lethal Weapon films alone just transported him to a level of fame that is only occupied by, I guess, four or five people at any one time. We're looking at people like Arnold Schwarzenegger in the 80s and 90s, 
Bruce Willis, Sylvester Stallone, Tom Cruise and a couple of others. Because of that reason, Mel Gibson then brings to each character that he plays a sort of star quality. He brings a load of preconceived notions about what his characters will be like, and that's changed over time. He isn't the reckless soul that he was when he made Mad Max in the first Lethal Weapon film. He was called Lethal Weapon because he was the lethal weapon. He was crazy. He's not like that anymore. He's softened. He's made films like What Women Want and, and rom-coms for Hollywood studios. Now, Tom Hardy presents us with a fresh opportunity. He's a hard man, or at least he plays hard man in an awful lot of his films. You look at recent films like, say, Legend or Locke, and he plays angry characters with broken, mysterious pasts. For that reason, he's kind of a blank slate for us to paint a new film on, a fresh canvas for us to look at this character in a new way. And it's a very interesting way. And so for that, whilst I really did love Mel Gibson as Mad Max, I truly adore Tom Hardy as Mad Max. Why do you think hamsters make a good pet? Because they are furry. You can pet them. What are the main challenges of keeping a hamster as a pet? The, ch the challenges are challenging. <laughs> Bob. Next steps. Pet. Why would someone want a pet that's only awake at night? Oh. So nocturnal. They're not turning because they are furry and they have got next steps. <laughs> Sometimes you have to clean up their poo and it looks like little currants. <laughs> Inside a one. Would you advise an older person to have a hamster as a pet? Who is old? Like your grandparent. My grandparent, Dr. Key. Um, yes. So, how long have you had your hamster? 